Like Fourier series, the Fourier transform provides a new perspective from which to view functions, known as frequency spectra. In this section, I'm going to introduce the notion of frequency spectra in the context of the Fourier transform and explain how the Fourier transform naturally leads to this notion. Like Fourier series, the Fourier transform also leads quite naturally to the notion of frequency spectra for functions. Unlike Fourier series, however, which can only handle periodic functions, the Fourier transform can handle both periodic and aperiodic functions. As a result, the Fourier transform leads to a notion of frequency spectra that is applicable to both periodic and aperiodic functions. In this sense, the Fourier transform is a more general tool than Fourier series. To begin, I'd like to recall the basic ideas behind frequency spectra from our earlier discussion of Fourier series. Think of a function. Essentially, a function embodies information of some sort. The traditional way to view this information is as being distributed with respect to time. In other words, the function is viewed as having a particular value at each point in time. The Fourier transform, however, provides a new way to view the information embodied by a function. Instead of viewing the function as having information distributed with respect to time, we can view the function as having information distributed with respect to frequency. In other words, the function is viewed as having a particular amount of information at each frequency. This distribution of information in a function over different frequencies is known as the frequency spectrum of a function. When a function is viewed in terms of its frequency spectrum, the domain of the function effectively becomes frequency instead of time. For this reason, this new perspective on functions is often referred to as the frequency domain, whereas the more traditional way of viewing functions is referred to as the time domain. As we'll see shortly, the Fourier transform provides a means to quantify how much information a function has at various frequencies. In other words, the Fourier transform provides a way to define the frequency spectrum of a function. As it turns out, many engineering problems can be solved much more easily when the problems are considered in terms of frequency spectra and the frequency domain perspective for functions. At this point, I'd like to show how the Fourier transform leads to the notion of frequency spectra. For this purpose, it's helpful to write the Fourier transform representation with the Fourier transform expressed in polar form. So here on this slide, we have the Fourier transform representation of the function little x, where big X here denotes the Fourier transform of little x. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the Fourier transform big X of omega in polar form. And in particular, I'm going to take the exponential that I get from writing big X of omega in polar form and combine it with the exponential that's already in this equation. And if I do this, what I end up with is this equation or formula on the right-hand side here. Now, if you look at this formula more carefully on the right-hand side, you can see that essentially what we're doing is we're integrating a complex sinusoid with the frequency omega. But in particular, when we're computing this integral, we're shifting this complex sinusoid by an amount that depends on the argument of big X of omega. In other words, on, depends on the argument of the Fourier transform. And we're also scaling the amplitude of this complex sinusoid by the magnitude of big X of omega. In other words, the magnitude of the Fourier transform. So in some sense, we can think of this magnitude of the Fourier transform as a weight that determines how significant a contribution the complex sinusoid at the frequency omega, in other words, this complex sinusoid here, makes to the overall integration result. And the significance of the argument of big X of omega is that it controls how much the complex sinusoid is shifted during integration. Now, since integrals are often more difficult to visualize than sums, it's beneficial to rewrite the integral in the Fourier transform representation on this slide as the limit of a sum. In particular, we can use the fact that the integral of a function is defined by this particular equation here. In other words, integration is simply defined as the limit of a sum. So what we can do is we can use this formula here to rewrite the integral that appears on this right-hand side here as the limit of a sum, and this is what's done on the next slide. Expressing the integral from the previous slide as the limit of a sum, we obtain this particular equation here, where the quantity omega is equal to k times delta omega. Now, if we look at this equation in more detail, essentially we have a sum where each of the terms in the sum is a complex sinusoid. 
So we have a complex sinusoid that generally looks like e to the j omega t, where the complex sinusoid is being shifted by an amount that depends on the argument of the Fourier transform, in other words, the argument of big X of omega. And the complex sinusoid is also amplitude scaled by a factor that depends on the magnitude of the Fourier transform, in other words, the magnitude of big X of omega. So for a given omega, which is associated with the kth term in the summation, the larger the magnitude of big X of omega is, the larger the amplitude of its corresponding complex sinusoid, e to the j omega t, will be, and therefore the larger the contribution the kth term will make to the overall summation. So in this way, we can use the magnitude of big X of omega as a measure of how much information the function little x has at the frequency omega. On this slide, I'd like to introduce some terminology related to the Fourier transform and frequency spectra, as well as make some additional comments on frequency spectra. So first, I'll start with a few definitions. The Fourier transform of a function is referred to as its frequency spectrum. The magnitude of the Fourier transform of a function is referred to as its magnitude spectrum. And the argument of the Fourier transform of a function is referred to as its phase spectrum. We can also make some observations about frequency spectra. Uh, since the Fourier transform is a function of a real variable, a function can potentially have information at any real frequency. This is different from the case of frequency spectra in the context of Fourier series, where a function can only have information at certain particular frequencies. Another observation that we can make is with respect to periodic functions. Recall from earlier that the Fourier transform big X of a periodic function little x with the fundamental frequency omega naught and the Fourier series coefficient sequence A is given by this particular formula here. What we can observe from this is that the notion of frequency spectra for both the Fourier transform and Fourier series give consistent results for periodic functions. In particular, in the context of the Fourier transform, the frequency spectrum of a periodic function can only be non-zero at integer multiples of the fundamental frequency, in other words, at frequencies of the form k omega naught. And we know this is also true for frequency spectra in the context of Fourier series. Also in the context of the Fourier transform, when the frequency spectrum is non-zero, it's equal to 2 pi a k times a delta function whereas in the context of Fourier series, it's simply equal to AK, which is also very, uh, very similar. So in this sense, the Fourier transform and Fourier series are consistent with one another in terms of frequency spectra. Lastly, as a practical matter, since the frequency spectrum is complex valued in the most general case, it's usually represented using two plots, one showing the magnitude spectrum and one showing the phase spectrum. At this point, I'd like to consider an example to further illustrate the concept of frequency spectra. And in particular, I'd like to consider example 6.30. In this example, we're given the function little x that's defined by this particular equation here. And we're told that this function has the Fourier transform big X given by this particular equation here. Then we're asked to do two things. In part A of the problem, we're asked to find and plot the magnitude and phase spectra of the function little x. And in part B of the problem, we're asked to determine at what frequency or frequencies the function little x has the most information. At this point, before proceeding further, I'm just going to scroll the example upwards so that we can see more of the solution. Recall that in part A of this problem, we're asked to find the magnitude and phase spectra of the function little x. So first, let's consider the magnitude spectrum. So to find the magnitude spectrum of the function little x, we simply need to take the magnitude of the function's Fourier transform, in other words, the magnitude of the function big x. So that gives us this line here, where we're just using the function big x that we were given. Then we can use the fact that the magnitude of the product is equal to the product of the magnitudes, in order to get from this line here to this next line, this line here. Then we can observe that the second factor here, the magnitude of e to the minus j omega, is simply equal to 1, because this is a complex number in polar form, and its magnitude is equal to 1. So that gets us to this next line. Then we can use the fact that the magnitude of the quotient is equal to the quotient of the magnitudes, which gets us to this last line. So now we have the 
the uh, expression for the magnitude spectrum. Next, we proceed on to finding the phase spectrum of little x. To find the phase spectrum of little x, we need to take the argument of the Fourier transform of little x. In other words, we need to take the argument of big x. So taking the argument of big x and using the formula for big x that we're given, we get this first line here. Then we can use the fact that the argument of a product is the sum of the individual arguments, and this gets us to this next line here. Then we can simplify the first term, the argument of e to the minus j omega, by observing that this is a complex number written in polar form. Therefore, the argument of e to the minus j omega is simply minus omega. So that gets us to this next line. Then we can observe that 1 over j is equal to the negative of j. And that gets us to this next line. And now we need to simplify the second term, in other words, this term here. So what we have is the argument of a complex number that lies on the imaginary axis. Because no matter how we choose omega here, minus j2 over omega is always going to be a point on the imaginary axis. In particular, if omega is less than zero, this point is going to be on the positive part of the axis. And if this quantity omega is greater than zero, this point is going to lie on the negative part of the axis. So looking at this diagram here, we have that if omega is less than zero, the argument of the complex number is going to correspond to this angle that's shown here, which is pi by two. In the case that the point's on the negative part of the axis, in other words, omega is greater than zero, the argument of the complex number is going to correspond to minus pi by two, in other words, this angle that's shown here. So with this in mind, we can rewrite this particular line here in terms of this second line, which consists of two cases, one case for omega greater than zero, and one case for omega less than zero. And then lastly, we can observe the only difference between the expressions for these two cases is in the first term that's highlighted in green. And by using the signum function, we can collapse these two cases together into a single case, which leads to this last line here. So now we have that the phase spectrum of little x, in other words, the argument of big x, is given by this particular formula here. Now we move on to part b of the problem. Recall that in part b of the problem, we were asked to determine at what frequency or frequencies the function little x has the most information. The approach that we need to take in this case is to look at the magnitude spectrum. In particular, we want to know where the magnitude spectrum is largest. So if we look at the expression that we obtained earlier for the magnitude spectrum, clearly this function is going to have a maximum at omega equal to zero, in other words, at the origin. In fact, at this point, the function's unbounded. So the conclusion that we come to is because the magnitude spectrum is largest at the frequency zero, in other words, at the origin, the function little x has the most information at the frequency zero. At this point, I'm going to scroll the example upwards so that we can see the remainder of the solution. In part a of this problem, we were also asked to plot the magnitude and phase spectra of the function little x. Here we've plotted each of these spectra using the formulas for them that were found earlier. So on the left we have a plot of the magnitude spectrum of little x, and on the right we have a plot of the phase spectrum of little x. At this point I just want to make a few comments about frequency spectra of real valued functions. Recall from earlier that the Fourier transform big X of a real valued function always satisfies the relationship of this particular form here. In other words, big X is conjugate symmetric. And this condition of conjugate symmetry is equivalent to this particular pair of conditions here. Where this first condition, in other words this one here, comes from taking the magnitude of both sides of this equation. And this second condition here comes from taking the argument of both sides of this equation. And essentially what these conditions are saying is that the magnitude spectrum of a real valued function is always even, and the phase spectrum of a real valued function is always odd. Since a real valued function has a frequency spectrum that is conjugate symmetric, the portion of the frequency spectrum for negative frequencies is completely determined by the portion of the frequency spectrum for non-negative frequencies. In this sense, the portion of the frequency spectrum for negative frequencies is completely redundant. For this reason, we often ignore negative frequencies when dealing with frequency spectra of real valued functions. Of course, we must sometimes deal with functions that are not real valued, and the frequency spectra of such functions are not conjugate symmetric. Consequently, negative frequencies play a crucial role when dealing with functions that are not real valued.
At this point, I need to introduce the notions of band limitedness and bandwidth of functions. The first definition that I need to introduce is that of a band limited function. In this regard, we have the definition given at the top of the slide. So just reading the definition, a function with the Fourier transform big X is said to be band limited if for some finite non-negative real constant B, a condition of this particular form is satisfied. And all this condition is saying is simply that the function big X is only non-zero over an interval of finite length. Next, I need to introduce the definition of the bandwidth of a function. The bandwidth B of a function with the Fourier transform big X is defined by this particular relationship here. And essentially what this relationship is saying is that we're identifying the places where the Fourier transform big X is potentially non-zero and we're labeling this as the interval from omega naught to omega one and then we're simply defining the bandwidth to be equal to the length of that interval which is simply by definition omega one minus omega naught. In the case of real valued functions the preceding definition of bandwidth is usually amended to consider only non-negative frequencies. This is due to the fact that we typically ignore negative frequencies when dealing with real valued functions. On this slide, we have a simple example to illustrate the definition of bandwidth. Essentially, we're given two functions, little x1 and little x2, that have the Fourier transforms big X1 and big X2, respectively. And we're told that the Fourier transform big X1 is as shown in this graph here, and the Fourier transform big X2 is as shown in this graph here. And what we want to do is we want to consider determining the bandwidth of each of the functions little x1 and little x2. So first let's consider the function little x1. So little x1 has this Fourier transform big X1, shown in this graph. And by inspecting the function big X1, it's evident that this function is conjugate symmetric. So the significance of this is since that big X1 is conjugate symmetric, little x1 must be a real valued function. Therefore, when we're considering the bandwidth, because the function little x1 is real valued, normally we don't consider negative frequencies. So ignoring the negative part of the axis, if we're determining the range over which the Fourier transform big X1 is non-zero, it's going to be from zero to B, because again, we're ignoring the negative frequencies. So the interval from zero to B is an interval of length B, therefore the bandwidth of the function little x1 is B. Then if we consider the function little x2, little x2 has the Fourier transform big X2 shown in this figure. And by looking at the graph of big X2, it's evident that big X2 is not conjugate symmetric. Therefore, the function little x2 is complex valued but not real valued. And because of this, in other words, because the function little x2 is not real valued, normally we consider negative frequencies when we're determining the bandwidth. So the Fourier transform big X2 is non-zero over the range from minus B over two to plus B over two, and this interval is an interval of length B. Therefore, the bandwidth of the function little x2 is B. Lastly, it's important to note that a function cannot be both time-limited and band-limited. This fact is worth mentioning since it has very far-reaching consequences, some of which place significant constraints on how real-world problems can be solved. Incidentally, the fact that a function cannot be both time-limited and band-limited follows from the time-domain scaling property of the Fourier transform, which states that applying a time compression or expansion transformation to a function in the time-domain results in an opposite compression or expansion effect in the frequency domain.